Namaste. So uh, we're getting some interesting comments and questions, and I'm going to go over those in a minute. But I first want to preface those with saying something about the scope of this teaching. Uh, this uh, secret heaven, uh, heaven iron shirt, cheek of, say that fast five times. <laughs> secret heaven, iron shirt, and cheek of. Um, this teaching is part of karma yoga. It's on the platform of Dvaita Vada. Why? It takes the body as real. See? On the platform of Vivarta Vada, what to speak of uh, Ajata Vada, uh, I mean, even in Vishishta Dvaita Vada, in Bhakti, there's a doubt about the reality of the body. But in Dvaita Vada, the body is the base. Buddha says in one of his suttas, he's talking about the, the quicksilver nature of the mind. And he's trying to illustrate how changeable the mind is by a, an uh, illustration, a metaphor, a simile. But he confesses that he can't come up with an adequate simile to explain how quickly and how completely the mind can change in a very short time. If you observe yourself, you've seen this happening, right? So he's trying to explain this, and he's saying, you know, really, if you want a basis for your identity, your individuality, and who you are, Better to use the body as a basis, the ordinary gross physical body, because it's longer lasting, it's more consistent, it persists more than the mind. I mean, look, yeah, look at the body is there day after day after day. It ages, but it's imperceptible on a day-to-day -day basis. What to speak of the mind. Man, the mind is all over the place. It's all over the universe. So, we find the group of body-based teachings in general fall within karma yoga. And because they accept the body as real, that view is Dvaita Vada. So, that's all right. <laughs> that's all right. Because... If you want to erect a huge construction like a skyscraper, it has to have an adequate foundation. A tree, a tree's roots go as deep into the ground as the crown rises above it, and as wide as the branches spread, uh, the roots go under the soil. You can't see it, but without that foundation, the tree would easily topple. Right. And so there are some trees that only have a taproot and they're very susceptible to wind and stuff like that. So now I want to get into uh, some of the questions that have come up. Come on, wake up. I put it on my tablet here. Now it doesn't want to, it doesn't want to wake up and show me. Oh, here we go. Okay, some of the viewers wrote in some very good questions. And one of them is a clinical psychologist and says, I'd like to know more about the clinical background of your observation that prenatal incidents or prenatal um, trauma inclined you towards uh, sensuality and extreme sensations and tantra and stuff like this. Well, my mom and dad were tantricas. They were practicing... Uh, what's called Karezza or Kareza. Uh, and it's a uh, de derivative of some tantric methods that involve prolonged intercourse and like that. And the idea is to withhold orgasm for as long as possible. And uh, this is a really excellent technique, you know. Uh, it's definitely part of our secret heaven curriculum. <laughs> as I inherited it, you know, from my mom and dad. And uh, while I was in the womb, 
during the critical implantation stage of zygotic development. You know, the egg gets fertilized by the sperm, becomes a zygote, and then the zygote has to migrate from the fallopian tubes down into the uh, womb and, and uh, attach to the wall and start to grow a placenta in order to get fed. So this is a pretty high priority, high risk operation because the, the womb is not the cozy, friendly environment, you know, of later pregnancy. It's, uh, it's the wild west, it's the jungle. It's a bacterial and, and fungal uh, jungle down there on the cell level of scale. So the poor zygote has to traverse this hostile terrain. I mean, I, I, I don't know how many video games must have been inspired by this, huh? <laughs> Blasting the uh, space aliens, you know, because all these other cells and fungi and stuff must look really weird from the perspective of the zygote. And then the zygote has to attach to the wall and start to grow to placenta. And this is also a critical phase uh, because it's like a kind of bonding between the fetus and the mother. Now, any and all of this can be influenced by, disturbed by, or turn into a trauma very quickly, uh, depending on the location of the zygote on the uh, placental wall. And uh, the posture of the mother, uh, any pressures on the body, and so on like this. Um, so the content in my case, was actually pretty benign. It was, you know, sweet nothings whispered between lovers, you know, like this. And it was also very exciting because it was extremely prolonged, their tantric uh, uh, practices, you know, going on for hours sometimes, uh, sometimes days without an orgasm. There's a description in the... Uh, uh, Tripura Rahasya, uh, that in the beginning of the universe, Lord Shiva and Parvati made love for a thousand celestial years without stopping and without having an orgasm. So when Shiva finally did have an orgasm, his semen was so potent it couldn't be kept safely anywhere in the, in the universe. <laughs> It was something like, you know, uh, hydrogen fusion or something like, it was very, very, you know, extremely potent. So uh, a lot of the celestial beings were freaking out and trying to contain it all. And, and uh, finally Shiva had to keep it himself. There's nobody else who could hold it. So this technique of delaying orgasm produces highly potent semen that then can uh, give rise to bringing in a high quality being from the between life state. And this was their aim. They did this deliberately, consciously. So that's how I came to be. And so the qualities of the, of the, uh, the incidents that are there in the prenatal area were like pressure, pain, sometimes uh, violent motion, you can imagine, you're shaking like this, uh, during coitus, and, uh, and of course just the, the kind of sweet nothings that lovers whisper to each other, you know. So the mood was actually very beautiful, right? It was just happened to be physically stressful for the fetus. So it gets recorded in the tissues. Whenever the tissues are disturbed, the structure of the tissues, the disturbance itself, like a scar, forms a recording of the incident and also an electronic version is recorded in the memory as an image picture uh, of an experience, a, like a sensory snapshot. Uh, so that comes, uh, gets accessed later on when anything similar occurs in real time. So these become the vasanas and the desires that we bring with us into life and that guide and shape our behavior in so many ways. Uh, so what was the question again? <laughs> what were the clinical details? Oh, 
Yeah, so it was, uh, it was sexual, it was sensual, it was prolonged, it was very passionate, uh, it was uh, very loving, uh, and it was also uh, highly energetic because of the practices they were doing. So all of these elements go together into, mm, to make my, mm, not predestination or fate exactly, but a tendency, an inclination toward a certain type of experience, trying to fulfill or complete that earlier traumatic experience. See? So to experience the same things again in a more positive atmosphere without any, without any life-threatening elements to it, okay, where everything's under control, is the therapeutic mode. Uh, you know, a, a small dose of the same poison, right? The hair of the dog that bit you <laughs> gets you through it. Okay. Another question from a viewer. What if my core taste... Watch what he tries to do. So what if my core taste is tender and soft, just the opposite of the taste that you describe? I bet, I would bet 10 bucks that this is coming from his girlfriend. <laughs> Am I right? And uh, whether or not it is, that's not the point. That's just a side bet. <laughs> the big bet is, the main bet, is that if it's not passionate, if it's not highly energetic, then your, your, your other associated centers closely connected with the sex center are not operating at a high enough energy level. So I think we need to uh, review the seven energy states and the uh, erotic and sexual phenomena connected with those seven states. Just like there are seven chakras there are seven energy states. Uh, it's just like in astrology, you have Mahadashas where one planet becomes very dominant in your chart, even though they all are still present. But one planet will like run the show, you know, conduct the orchestra uh, for a time. Uh, well, in the same thing, in the same way, <laughs> one taste, uh, one uh, particular mode of sensual or erotic expression can conquer all the other ones, right? One center can also assume dominance. Uh, for example, when it's a person's moving center, then all their activities become subordinated to movement, like sports, okay? Or when it's the emotional center, maybe a person becomes extremely emotional or extremely social, and so on, you see? So in that way, a person's center of gravity, uh, I mean, it has to be consistent, you know? If you expect a high-level performance of the upper chakras, then you have to build that on high-level performance of the lower chakras. This is just common sense, you know? It's architecture. It's like building blocks, right? Really basic stuff. You have to put the foundation at the bottom, and it has to be as strong, if not stronger, than the whole superstructure that it supports, okay? Because all the energy is coming from that foundation, from the, the sex center, the, the chi storage center, and the moving center. Those three act together. They work together as a team. Huh? It's a triple. It's a bona fide ontological triple, and it's what makes the body seem real. That there's this energy economy, this very, very complex give and take of chi or prana between the seven chakras. And it's also reflected in our, our uh, attention. What kind of attention do we give to things? Uh, when we think we have to do something, what do we do? Think, speak, get emotional, move around a lot, <laughs> do stuff, 
You see, what level or what chakra do we use as our uh, primary presence in life? Are we viewed or seen or perceived as a very physical-oriented person or emotional-oriented person or intellectual-oriented person or what? Uh, it's according to how we present ourselves, to how we confront reality, with what we use as a shield or actually a screen to project our personality onto, our individuality, right, that we're creating and imagining. <laughs> so anyway, I think um, we're going to have to go back. I'm going to have to dig up that chart, the seven chakras and seven energy states and the types of orgasm and all that, and uh, redo that for the next episode. Great questions. Thank you very much. This, this whole thing is really working for me. Om Tat Sat. Buddha Sarai. <laughs>